A jointer's only job is to get a board flat so that we can glue them up together. Nice tight joints with no air gaps. And it really doesn't matter whether you're using a hand tool or a power tool, you can get the job done. But do you realize these two variations, kind of like the sharks and jets, cats and dogs, do everything entirely differently. One does stuff based on arcs, the other based on lines. Do you know the difference? Today we'll discuss. Hand planes are a fairly simple device, not too many parts in them, but when you're working with a jointer, the idea is you want to get as long a plane body as possible to get a straight of surface on bottom over the longest distance. And the longer the plane blade, the straighter you can make a longer board. Generally advised, if you're going to plane something straight, you want a plane that's maybe half or a third the total length of whatever you're trying to straighten out. This right here is a Bailey number 7, uh, and they also make a number 8, which is quite a bit longer and heavier. And the idea is you just start on one end, and push it off the other, and you go until you get solid shavings to get a very straight board. Some people like me put a cambered iron, a cambered blade, into their jointer because with a slight curve, I have the option of taking off a little bit more on one side or the other, depending upon where I want it to lean. So if I notice I'm shaving down the center, but it's coming off a little bit heavy, or it's not quite 90 degrees, I can then use my finger fence to move the whole thing over and only take shavings off of one side this time. Or I can do the same exact thing to the other side, just using my finger as a fence to guide it on what part of the blade I want to take a shaving off of. The advantage of doing that one is you induce a curve into the board so that you have one board and then it's got a slight curve into it and obviously I'm over exaggerating in this drawing and then you have the other board that you're gluing up to it and it has an identical curve so there's the slightest of gap in there. The glue is going to bring those two gaps together and s compress the fibers right there to give you an even tighter joint. There will less chance of gaps. But we are talking on the hundreds of thousands of an inch difference. So really it might be just theoretical. But it does give you the ability to adjust if your boards are coming out lopsided because you can take off more on one side than the other. But that's not the only curve a hand plane is dealing with. Let's take a smoothing plane. You have a plane that's about, you know, six to eight inches across and then you have the 45 degree blade coming through it. Now when you plane with something like that you're actually planing an arc because wherever the bottom of the blade is it's going to shave it off and the end result is going to be that surface. That's why smoothing planes are smaller than jointers because they can go in and out of curves. All you're concerned with is getting the surface finished with a smoothing plane. You're not flattening or straightening anything. A jointer, on the other hand, because the two points are so much farther apart, basically the curve is a lot slighter. So the longer you have it, the less curve is. And once again, if your blade is only coming down maybe a thousandth of an inch off the base, that is a very, very slight curve to the point where it's imperceptible in real life. But this only works if the hand plane is dead flat on bottom. And in actuality, all you need it to be is in a parallel line at these three points. If it cups up underneath here or underneath here, it really doesn't matter. It's nice to have something dead flat because you can use it as a reference surface. But when you're flattening the bottom of a plane, those are the only three points you really need to be concerned with. Once they are in line, the plane will work properly. But if they are curved, then that if this curves up here, well guess what? You have more of a chance of it not becoming flat. The end result being as flat as it could be. A power jointer, on the other hand, has to have straight lines. It can't have any curves whatsoever 
other than the cutter head. Now with an electric one, you will notice that when you put your board on, flat, on the top flat, there's a gap down below. That's how much wood you will be taking off. Because this plane and that plane are in line with each other. In order for it to slide evenly up to the top level, you have to remove that lumber. So, you can actually see as the cutter head removes it, it will slide on top. So in essence, as you feed the board across, these have to be absolutely in line with each other across the full width. Otherwise, it won't transition on, when the board comes across, it won't transition from one side to the other. Now that is a issue when you are setting up a jointer. And in fact, a lot of people will put their jointers out of alignment have their in feet not in line with their out feet because as you feed the board across and it's sitting on here it shaves wood off and it transitions you can induce a slight curve and once again we're talking about thousands of an inch but these are jointers that a lot of times if they're gluing up two boards they do that a whole bunch maybe they're making tables they want a little bit of a spring joint where there's a slight gap in the middle so that they can squeeze the two outside together they'll put more pressure on the very far corners and they'll be less likely to crack over time but you can only really do that one if you're just jointing two boards because once you add a third board well then you have to have this one straight and you can put a slight curve on the two outsides to get your spring joint add a fourth and you're better off just being dead perfect but that is why a lot of people stress on their power tools about moving them around because we are only talk, we're only talking about a few thousandths of an inch here and if it settles in one part of your garage and you move it and it settles there things could change especially if you have some of the not twenty thousand dollar jointers so as you can see a hand plane even though it's producing just as straight lines as a joint power jointer it deals in curves where a power jointer has to have straight lines now you're sitting there saying hey Sean how could this one be as accurate as that one well it's how you set it up it's kind of hard to set up a power jointer to take off a thousandth of an inch generally you're taking off a 32nd a 64th or a 128th but it's it's a lot more where you can take very very fine shavings with a hand plane and because the curve is so long and the shavings are so fine you can get it a little bit straighter plus you don't have these uh, if the bits you're not going to have these wavy cuts a lot of people will actually joint a board on their power jointer and then pay, take one pass with a plane to remove those tiny high spots and when you do that, when you can actually feel it, it doesn't come off as a smooth curl. It comes off as a jut, 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 as it's doing those high spots. If you go slow enough on your power jointer, or you have a helical cutter head, which offset a lot of cuts, that isn't that big an issue. But I'm going to throw a curve at you. There is one hand plane out there that is more like this. And if you get a true Japanese hand plane, one that's made by a real blacksmith and a real, um, oh, I'm forgetting what they call them now, the guy that does the wood part. Because they are so specialized, one guy is not making both parts. But what they do is they build their hand plane. And then one of the last steps is they take another hand plane and shave off a thousandth of an inch on the front so that they are slightly offset and then the plane does not protrude past the base it protrudes in line with the base so you're basically just removing the part of the wood that's going to go there now how they make those as accurate as they do is beyond me but the more of the story is it doesn't matter if you're a jet or a shark 
if you're a cat or a dog. You can use different techniques to get to the same end result. So for today's bonus, I'm going to talk about the one book that every new woodworker should buy. Yeah, there's one that's somewhat of the Bible out there. But before we do that one, if you've gotten anything out of this video, you can do me a big favor. Liking, favoriting, subscribing this video, doing all those other social medias. And if you really are getting something out of this series or any of my longer form videos, I just published one on four aspects of turning bowl blanks. Uh, then please consider visiting WorthEffort.com. I have an online store there that sells a lot of swag, some of my own personal artwork, and some shop-made tools that I occasionally come out with. In addition, I have some other free content, such as blogs, and I might be doing some plans in the future. So visit WorthEffort.com. The Essential Woodworker by Robert Wearing. If you haven't gotten this book, and especially if you're a woodworker like me that kind of dabbles in both power and hand tools, this is the book you can you should get. It is so well written and the illustration shows you so many things from construction techniques for cabinets and tables, uh, caged carcasses, joinery. There's so much detailed information about joinery and it's written to my reading level. Uh, it's just wonderful. I mean this is the Bible of woodworking uh, in the modern age, my opinion. If you haven't picked it up, you can find them on used bookstores quite a bit. It's been in production for years. I don't even know how many print runs it's done. Uh, yeah, it doesn't say, but it was reprinted by Lost Art Press with a lot of additional illustrations and pictures. So, pick it up if you can. Uh, the Essential Woodworker by Robert Wearing.